Brendan. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you. I appreciate you coming on such a gorgeous afternoon and taking the time to hear about how COVID impacted on community organizations and uh, the impact of uh, isolation and the lack of that human touch and traditions that uh, have become so important to many people. Um, just want to, first of all, thank our funder, uh, Public Health Agency of Canada for funding that allowed us to produce these in webinars. We'd also like to thank our partner, Community Health and Social Service Network, CHSSN, for their support with the project. Uh, we have four delightful presenters uh, who are going to uh, give us lots of information of what they encountered and the impacts that they saw. And uh, I would advise you all that as you have questions, please type them and put them in the chat box. We will hold the question and answer period to the very end after the four presenters. Then you will make your, uh, um, uh, Katia, the Executive Director of Seniors Action Quebec, will be asking the presenters the question and will give us the answer. If you have a specific presenter that you would like to address your question to, just put their first name and your question and we'll understand. So without further ado, I am going to start with our very first presenter, who is Diane Kite, Program Officer at the English Community Organization of La Nadiere, which is the Upper Laurentians. She has been with their Wellness Center Center Activity Coordinator and Facilitator for the past eight years. <laughs> After studying in gerontology, she worked briefly in long-term care then as an activity coordinator for the community organization Elder Help of La Nanziere from 1997 until COVID hit in 2020. Um, so now she is with uh, Ecol and uh, Diane, I can't thank you enough. <laughs> I know that you've been very, very busy and I appreciate your time. And uh, you're going to tell us uh, what your organization, staff, volunteers face when COVID hit, and if there's any specific items that would be more pertinent for someone in mainland Quebec or other people call off island. I turn it right over to you. Thanks, Ruth. Uh, I want to thank um, Seniors Actions Quebec, uh, for inviting me onto this discussion panel. Um, I must confess that uh, I was reticent at first. Uh, I did not really want to revisit the trauma which COVID-19 brought upon us and the seniors in our community uh, who we were trying to serve. But obviously, yes, I am here. And, um, and as I sat down with our uh, he calls senior outreach worker to discuss the challenges we had faced. I felt again the feelings of anxiety that were part of our daily lives, uh, especially at the beginning of the pandemic. So uh, that feeling of trauma is still in the background. Um, so I'm here to address um, the challenges uh, that our organization faced. Um, I'll remind you that it is from my perspective. I'm speaking, yes, as an employee of ECOL, um, but it is m from my perspective uh, working with seniors for so many years and, and what happened in that time frame. So obviously March 12th, 2020, um, we can't forget that date. It was ECOL's last day of activities. After the initial shock, we began processing the immediate needs of our community. We did, divided up lists of names, especially those most vulnerable who had no internet, and phone calls were made to ensure that the basic needs were being met, um, ensuring all had enough food, medication, if they had family or neighbors who could help them out, and reminding them of hygiene protocol and physical distancing. Uh, in the beginning, that was difficult for seniors to understand that they had to stay away and stay back. And uh, it was a whole learning curve. 
In those early days, my job changed from activity coordinator to an outreach worker and communications officer. The staff basically had to reinvent ourselves. ECOL reached out to other community organizations to see what they were doing. We partnered with some and started doing grocery deliveries. But the major challenge was how seniors would pay for the groceries. We weren't equipped for Interact payment. Stores did not want cash and many of our seniors did not use online banking or even have a credit card. So we accepted checks and money in Ziploc bags. Eventually, we organized a theme series of gift bag and meal deliveries ourselves to our most isolated seniors. Our intergenerational activities with the schools and our seniors, many of whom were in residences, came to a standstill. But on a positive note, when students did return to class, they made Christmas, Valentine and Easter cards uh, that were put in the gift bags for our seniors, which brought many smiles all around. But we laughed when we thought about that those bags had to stay in quarantine for 48 hours before they were given to the seniors. Uh, yeah, though many of our older senior volunteers stopped volunteering, younger members in our community uh, who were off work at that time stepped in and helped with the meal deliveries. Unfortunately, volunteerism in our organization has not returned to the pre-pandemic numbers. I must mention the importance of our senior outreach worker, Jocelyn, who went over and above her job description of supporting seniors in their homes. She hunted down and distributed PPE. She sat outside seniors' homes in all kinds of weather to chat through windows and doors brought and delivered groceries. She supported family members who could not visit their loved ones, who were isolated in their homes and in long-term care. She helped us with the navigation of technology and accessing, printing and plastifying their vaccine passports. When I asked Jocelyn what was the most difficult part, she said, watching her elderly clients deteriorate before her eyes. It still gets me. <laughs> so she shared a quote from one of her clients and it hits home. At my age, I only have a few years left and they are being wasted away. Yeah. So some of the challenges that staff faced, uh, was trying to follow and stay up to date on the daily info coming from our government sources. It was overwhelming for us. I can't even imagine what it was like for our seniors. Checking the number of cases and deaths from COVID when I look back on it, it still feels surreal. We struggled with motivation, productivity, depression, and eventually COVID fatigue. I'll share one story with you about the reality of doing this job that I truly love. Early on, I had finished watching the daily press conferences and started making my phone calls to my list of seniors. One lady in particular, which um, I knew very well, who had been part of uh, the other community group I was working with, we were discussing how to keep active and uh, how she was doing so. And uh, she said, I've decided to write my memoirs. And she brought me, she took me down a trip, a trip down memory lane. But it was for her family members because she was sure 
she was absolutely sure that she would not see them again, that she wasn't going to make it out. And that really affected me to see seniors in that kind of state. So yes, um, we all struggled with fear and anxiety. If you remember a simple trip to get groceries was stressful, uh, but for many it was their only outing. Yet there was this feeling of solidarity. That we were all in the same boat and with the help of our partners at the CHSSN, through resilience training, we learned to practice better self-compassion and stress management. There were additional challenges in the rural regions. Two of those major challenges, especially in Lanaudière North, was the lack of internet access and knowledge of technology. I speak not only for our seniors, but for ourselves included. There was a mad rush to hook up and educate ourselves with Zoom, live streaming and recording equipment. The biggest feat was, number one, convincing our seniors to join us online. Number two, teaching them how and then setting up a tablet lending program and providing support for the inevitable issues that did arise and still arise to this day. Extra costs were incurred for staff training, live streaming platforms, camera and recording equipment, and the amount of time it took to complete simple tasks due to the long lineups as a result of COVID protocols. Resiliency became the new motto. I resumed my role finally as activity coordinator and went virtual in June of 2022, uh, 20, I'm sorry. Our team started filming and producing live cooking segments, exercise sessions, musical and cultural appreciation, videos and virtual book clubs to help break social isolation. During the summer months, we organized activities outside with physical distancing and masks. Ecole even bought a huge tent and a propane heater to enable us to continue our activities into the fall. But the difference in participation in our senior wellness centers compared to the virtual was immense, a drop of over 50%. Our ability to fulfill our mission in supporting and serving not only our seniors, but the whole English speaking community was greatly diminished. We have bounced back and this past year, especially this summer, saw a revitalization, meaning the feeling of ease with being together again had returned. And I will end on that note. Uh, it feels good to be back to the new normal. Thank you. Diane, thank you very much. That was extremely touching. And you can sense your compassion for seniors, your community, and how it really impacted on the day-to-day -day quality of life of people. Really appreciate it. If people have questions, they're just going to constantly be reminding you, please type them in the chat box. And if they're for Diane, you can put her name there. And we will be asking the questions of all the presenters at the end. We're going to immediately move forward. And uh, our next presenter is Brenda Yu, Director of uh, Programs and Communications for Cummings Center, uh, Marketing and Communications as well. And she's been in this role since April, 2019. So she started <laughs> right at the, 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 the hot spot. She came to the center with a wealth of experience working at various 
management positions for 35 years at Miriam Home, know it well, and services, and a community residential manager, intake manager, and manager of community and work integration services. Brenda has served on numerous committees, recently as co-chair of the, oh boy, NJHSA, new, I don't know what that stands for, Brenda. Network of Ju uh, Jewish Human uh, Services uh, Associations or Agencies. Thank you. Uh, for older adults, ensuring the support of the older adult community was critical over the past few years when our population was impacted with the isolation from COVID-19 restrictions and as coming center went from an in-person only center to an online only center. Um, we're going to see a general theme perhaps, but I'm sure there's going to be some little tidbits and new aspects that we may have not thought of. Brenda, I'm turning it right over to you and thank you so much for doing this for us. Thank you very much, Ruth, and thank you for the invite and giving me the opportunity to uh, talk here. Um, I just have to say that um, I could have taken Diane's presentation and just stuck it right in mine because I think we saw very similar things occurring. So uh, just to let you know that um, this is the how, we're, how the new reality was addressed. So first I'm gonna talk a bit about how we were impacted and then on how we were addressed. Uh, just to, for the next page, please, Brendan. Just to give you an idea, in case you don't know who we are, uh, the Cummings Center has been around for approximately 75 years now. And our mission is to uh, give the best quality of life for people who are 50, 50 plus. We also have volunteer services for uh, children who are 12 years and over. And um, we are trying to always provide the best kind of services Initially was with our immediate community. And then as um, the pandemic progressed, we were able to expand virtually. And now we're actually coast to coast virtually, as well as being in Europe and Israel. We have um, 300 programs uh, plus each semester. And uh, we also have a virtual library that we uh, provide to other people as well. And we had it's free for our members and other agencies as well can access our virtual library where we change constantly our programs. Um, there's 300 of them and we always update them with new ones as well. Next slide, please. So our values are for the three pillars of service and the three pillars of our service is program department, volunteer department and social services. We, um, service approximately 10,000 people annually because of all the, the three pillars that we have. And we always include this in our core, the respect and dignity, diversity, equity, inclusion, empowerment, excellence, and compassion. So as I said, originally we were, original, originally we were a Jewish organization and now because of our new values, we have been open always to other people and other cultures as well. We're trying to make people aware of our availability. Uh, we have different bilingual programs. As much as possible, we make our programs bilingual in English and French. Sometimes we're able to do simultaneous translation for our videos. And we have courses of all different languages in English, French, Italian, Spanish, Yiddish, and Hebrew, to name a few. We have uh, LGBTQ plus committees that we're working with as well with the Jewish community. And we have a lot of uh, multi-ethnic staff as well. You turn the page, please. So here's a lot of reading, but you don't have to read it all or you can just listen to me, it's up to you. Um, I just wanted to outline the areas that we were affected immediately. And as I said, the previous presentation outlined very much the same thing. Um, in March, all our in-person programs were canceled. We didn't have anything virtually and all our staff were reduced. So we had to look at just having um, the main staff around, which uh, also affected services. That everyone was told a two week closure. The two week closure quickly became two years. Um, the seniors were cut off from socializing with their friends and families, especially those who were 70 and over as they were not allowed to leave homes at all. And we saw a lot of uh, people with a lot of anxiety and depression. Uh, we had to develop access to virtual programs 
and support because people were missing that contact. And um, again, all our staff had to go from uh, knowing nothing with virtual and none of our members or our volunteers to only providing programs virtually over our spring summer 2020. Our own online programs, um, we only had online programs and everybody was working from home, which was again was very new. That was in the program department, the social services. Uh, again, the seniors were not allowed, were not permitted to leave and their request for services increased as a result. They didn't have any access to gross. You'll see in the other one that we pivoted to uh, allow them to have uh, access to them because a lot of our volunteers were 70 and over. And as a result, those volunteers were not allowed to leave their homes and we had to find new volunteers to deliver our meals. A lot of it was flexibility and you'll see that um, along for the next slide as well, that we had to maintain a very flexible environment. Jobs that were once those of um, staff or volunteers, we took on multiple jobs. So everywhere in all the departments, we saw something common. We had a uh, fear of COVID, isolation at home and curfews leading to depression and social stigmatization. People were unable to grieve as per cultural norms. So the Jewish religion, we um, have a funeral and then we sit Shiva where people come to your house or to the house of the person who passed away and you usually sit with them and you talk about the person and it's a grieving period of seven days. We were unable to do this and that really affected a lot of people, the way that they were able to grieve or not grieve or even go to visit people in the hospital. Um, I had staff that could not go see their dying family members because they were only allowed to have one representative uh, to go into the hospital. That took a big toll. So not only were we supporting our members, we were supporting our staff as well. Uh, so in the, in the program department, our virtual library, one of the things we did was we opened it up to everyone. Everybody in the whole world could come to our virtual library. And we tried to promote that a lot with the marketing department. So people would come and it was free for everybody. Right now, we went back to it's being free for members, which membership's only like $30 a year. Um, but we also have access to it through other programs such as Cummings to Community or Cummings, Cummings to You, where we have um, programs, people, organizations, especially those who may not, who might be on the outskirts and are having program, uh, problems finding programmers or specialists. We have prepared programs that they could have a group of people and watch it around a TV. So we did that as well during the pandemic. Uh, we needed a lot of support for people to get onto the virtual. So for the first, um, the, fir the all throughout spring and summer, all our programs were also free virtually. And then in the fall, we started to charge for access to our programs. And that gave the staff time and the members time to get used to being virtual. It all, there also was extra costs for laptops, for example, at the beginning of the pandemic we had only six laptops for the whole agency and we needed 90. So we had to quickly turn around, um, get grants, get money, find money and get laptops for 90 people, which it was quite a demand. Um, marketing com communications was critical and as well as our outreach, uh, we worked with a lot of our organizations in order to, uh, there was organizations that were giving away PPE equipment, masks, et cetera. So we really needed that for the people that were in touch with our members. In the social service department and in the program department and in the volunteer department, we did a lot of care calls and that was crucial in supporting our members. Um, some of it was with emails as well. And it was not just the emotional support, but also the information to give them about the precautions, access to vaccines. And that was also put on our website as well. The Meals on Wheels, again, a lot of staff had to get involved. We couldn't find enough volunteers necessarily. A lot of our volunteers were 70 and older. And at one point we even raised the, or lowered the age a bit so that we were concerned about our older volunteers. So a lot of us, um, you know, hands-on and do whatever you can. And people were helping to deliver uh, groceries and shopping for them as well. As, as, um, as you know, 
people were not able to go into the grocery stores. In the volunteer department, it was crucial that we had government grants, intergenerational opportunities, and they provided a lot of education on the vaccines, professional advices, and even psychological support for, for our members. So those are some of the things that we um, faced. And it's pretty much what Diane said before. I think we're gonna see a lot of people are going to say the same same um, as we both said. The, the impact was great on, on everybody. And especially in Coming Center, we are a center that is like, um, it's a place where people come to come see their friends, to come develop new relationships. And they were really missing that. Uh, we're starting to come into person again. We're we're back in person now, and we're still maintaining our virtual, but that's going to be for another presentation. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Brenda. And uh, I myself can refer to Coming Center. I've been there as a presenter. I've participated in your programming. And in case people don't know, Coast St. Luke is the highest demographic of seniors. Uh, in the province of Quebec, at least, if not in, uh, in other places. Um, I marvel at the work you do and um, very touching uh, to hear about that loss of human contact, especially when people are faced with such a intimate and hard event as uh, grief, which we will hear from Father Manus uh, at the end. So if anybody has questions for um, Brenda, now's the time to put it in the chat box. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Beth Citrin. And this is another area of uh, had major impact, which was the organizations and companies that were providing home care services, the impact on the client receiving the services and also on the staff. So Beth is the founder and the CEO of Beth Care Service, Senior Services, a Montreal-based home care provider offering caregiving and advocacy services for seniors in need. Her commitment to the community is evident in her 15-year journey with seniors and their families who turn to her for support. Beth's passion for supporting seniors developed many years ago through her personal experience providing care and support to her mother and older brother, both living with dementia. Through these challenges, Beth learned how to form and maintain connections with key contacts within the local healthcare network. In collaboration with these partners, Beth and her Beth Care team were able to provide a safe and secure environment for individuals living with age-related limitations and coping with the loss of autonomy. So Beth, without further ado, I'm really anxious and interested in hearing what you're going to tell us. Wow, that sounded really good. <laughs> thank you. Um, Ruth, thank you for this opportunity to be here today to speak. And also um, thank you for everything that you do for uh, older adults and uh, the community and just advocating for all of them, it's it's very much appreciated. So, um, you know, I it's 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 very hard when I when I speak with individuals like you because I'm um, for profit, so it, it's a little bit different for us for us. But but my journey in the last fifteen years has um, been quite something, and of course, COVID came. So um, Brenda, a lot of my clients go to Cummings and the doors closing at Cummings had a huge effect on so many of my clients. And we had to also scramble to bring them in activities to do and just find ways to stimulate them and give them some sense of security. So um, being a home care, being working in the home care industry um, has taught me that um, to an older, okay, I'm gonna start over because this isn't my strength. So I'm just gonna go to my notes. Being in the home care industry has taught me that providing home care to an older adult in their home is a proactive strategy. And this service helps the individuals to feel safe in their environment. When we feel safe, it builds um, security, and with security, we all seem to function a lot better. 
The main purpose of home care is to remain home. The purpose of offering a home care service is to um, remain home in a safe and secure environment and enable us to function more independently. Uh, COVID definitely changed this for many, many of our seniors. Early on during the pandemic, when home care, when home care caregivers were locked out of long-term care facilities, this created a sense of panic and fear, which we've all mentioned already. Um, and uh, this is when the challenges really began for, for us in our industry. So this question brought to me today is how did the pandemic impact our service delivery? So it starts with the staff. Um, the fear and um, the fear and panic in the staff was so intense. The caregivers, they, they almost shut down emotionally. Uh, one of the things Brenda said, which was very true for us, is that as much as we had to take care of our clients, I have to admit the most power, powerful thing I had to take care of was my staff. I found that managing their panic and their fear was so much greater than the clients. Um, so many of the workers, they, they left the workforce um, due to the sphere and, and panic. They wanted to be protected. They wanted to protect their families from, from, from infection. And of course, they wanted to protect the clients. Going home, being with the children, going back to the clients, it, it was like a vicious circle. And um, the care team just really tried to pull away from leaving their homes just like everybody else did. Then, of course, there were the school, um, school closures and no childcare. So that within itself just made us have more and more staff pull back from working. Um, um, then we have the transportation issue. So the caregivers that would work, the caregivers that felt that they could manage this and they weren't in panic and they wanted to go to work, then you had the issue of them fearing being on public transportation. And then the ones that would go on public transportation you had the clients that wouldn't accept them because they were on public transportation. So there was really no, there was no solution. And like everybody else, we were, we were scrambling to figure out how were we going to take care of people? So everybody's journey is different. And sometimes a lot of the people that go to coming center may have assistance from a um, home care provider like myself that just needs maybe four visits a week, uh, four hours at a time, and it makes a difference for them. It gives them this sense of security and independence, and they know someone's coming, and they know that the big challenges that they may have in their house to take care of specific things someone else can take care of. But then we have the clients that needed 24-7, and that's when there were no choices they needed 24 seven, whether it have been to cognitive challenges or physical limitations, they had to have someone around the clock. So that's where we had to be extremely creative. And what had happened was, um, so the clients, um, the clients that had the financial means to implement care in their home to benefit themselves and the care team and put them all in a safe place and a safe environment, that worked well for those individuals because they had the financial means to make that happen. And it turned out in many cases to be actually a very beautiful thing to watch because some caregivers actually moved in with clients uh, you would put in two or three in a home and we locked the doors. And it turned out to be 
beautiful experiences because they they learned different cultures, they learned different cooking, they learned to communicate with with different ethnicities, um, individuals. Like, like it, it, it turned out to be really really a positive thing in those in those situations. But of course, um, the the cases where people needed a few hours of service, they were lost, they were isolated. And it just, it's, it's like everybody else said, it just wasn't a good situation. So, so our clients at home were, were scared, they were isolated, they were um, lonely, and we just had to find creative ways like everybody else to make things happen. And that's what our team ended up doing. Um, so today we look back and um, the, the, pandem the pandemic has affected us all, some of us harder um, in harder ways than others. Um, I think that the key to this experience is to try and look into it and find something that was, uh, that was maybe a little bit positive if we could all look back and, and you've, all, you've told stories and there were positive moments in there and we all learned so much. So, um, so what I'm gonna, I'm gonna end with is due to the pandemic, Beth Care Senior Services is now on a very serious mission. <laughs> I'm on a very serious mission and that mission is to keep as many older adults as I possibly can living in their own private homes. That's my mission. Um, I'm going to keep them safe. I'm going to keep them secure. And um, I'm going to take care of one at a time and do everything in my power to keep them out of long-term care facilities. <laughs> That's my ultimate goal. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Bev. And what a positive note to leave uh, a serious topic, but a necessary topic and service uh, on uh, and I think if we have companies and organizations working together to provide services, and of course we need the government to step up and take its role uh, to acknowledge the value that community organizations and companies like yours and others uh, are providing to keep people at home. The longer we keep people at home in healthy conditions, uh, when when they're well enough to be home, uh, it's much less expensive on the long-term care health uh, costs. And um, also we know we don't have enough residences for our seniors. So we better look at this positively and work together on it. Um, so, and I'm glad that you, uh, pleased to hear that uh, you did highlight, and I mean, there may be some questions about it, about the importance of self-care, because I think we all feel a little guilty if we take the time to look after ourselves. But I'll leave that for, for later. We're doing extremely well with time, which is going to be great, because that's going to leave us time for good discussion, because I can just see the community people that are sitting out there, and those in wellness centers, probably have a lot of questions. So uh, for a couple of you coordinators that are with wellness centers, perhaps you wanna get your group to put some questions together and you can get them uh, put in the chat box so that we can have them to address. So Beth, thank you, thank you. You did marvelous. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to a dear friend of mine uh, and a friend of many of my friends <laughs> who have used uh, the service of Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Father Manis. Uh, I would like to introduce him. Father Manis Bradley is a <laughs> pastor of eight Anglophone pa parishes that com comprise of St. Paul's Second Pastoral Unit and was ordained in 1989 in his home city and diocese of Derry, Northern Ireland. I had the good Irish boy. He worked in parish and school ministry for 16 years before volunteering to serve in the Anglophone Parish in the Canadian Diocese of Alexandria, Cornwall in 2005. He then moved to the Diocese of Montreal in 2007. And since 2015, he has ministered in the Diocese of Saint-Jean-Longuet. He is still incarnated in his home diocese of Derry and is on loan here. He describes himself as an accidental missionary. 
Uh, now I'm going to have trouble with some of these words, Anis, but anyway, we'll, we'll okay. give it a shot. Father Manis gained his honor degree, honors degree in modern history and philosophy from the National University of Ireland, an undergraduate honors degree in theology, as well as postgraduate, and I can't say that word, Listernat? Licentiate. Oh, dear Lord. Don't, don't even go there. <laughs> in sacred theology from the Pontifical University with a spe specialism in bioethics. I think I'm through the worst. Father That's Madness true. is engaged with a large and diverse population in his eight parishes, stretching from Boucherville to Cadillac and St. Lambert to St. Bruno, as well as encapsulating Longay, Greenfield Park, St. Joubert, and Brassard. As a Catholic priest working in multiple Anglophone parishes, he understands the need to be responsive to his parishioners' concerns and needs, whilst also trying to make himself available and to engage as much as possible beyond the boundaries of his parishes. Now, Father Bradley, or I refer to you as Father Manus, so I'm having trouble with the Bradley. Um, without further ado, I turn it over. I want to hear from you because I think everybody was horrified when we saw people passing away. Your, your, your talk today, your presentation is loss, grief, and mourning, a pastor's experience during COVID. So I'm turning it right over to you. Thank you, Ruth. And thank you, Seniors Action Quebec for inviting me to speak today uh, and participate in this uh, webinar. I think, uh, my my brief is a wee bit specific in the sense that I want to look at the whole area of loss, grief, and uh, you know the funeral aspect of of ministry that I participate in. And uh, you know, whilst my perspective is from a Catholic priest working in these eight parishes in the South Shore English parishes, I, I think the experience of grief and mourning uh, is pretty universal. Uh, its expression may differ due to cultural and liturgical differences between different uh, faith expressions, but it's the same experience. And again, just listen to everyone speaking so far. What strikes me is that, you know, we did all experience uh, that uh, anxiety and fear that went with COVID, especially in the early days. And, you know, I remember very early on, you know, especially in my parishes, nurses expressing fear that they would catch COVID at work and die. And even people like bus drivers that you wouldn't really imagine were, were scared because they were at that stage still working, driving around, picking up everyone, of course, who showed up to ride a bus. Uh, and there was, there, were, there was fear. So again, that was something that uh, I think struck many, many people in the society. Uh, volunteers, workers, staff, different agencies, and we all struggled to deal with it. And pastors as well, and the pastoral agents who work in our parishes, uh, we, we struggled to deal with it. We did experience, uh, I think, the most extreme uh, lockdowns uh, and curfews possibly in the world here in Quebec. And I think that colored how we uh, went through COVID as well. And uh, one of my responsibilities, of course, as pastor was to make sure that in my parishes, when we were allowed to open, that we opened safely. And one of the great things, and we somebody touched on this earlier on, was we experienced a growth actually in volunteers in our parishes. Some younger people in particular stepped forward because they realized the seniors who often do these volunteer roles weren't able to operate or were afraid to come to church, whatever. So when we were allowed to open, uh, we had volunteers who were new. So we actually drew some new volunteers during that time. I wanted to speak really about uh, grief and mourning and the experience of grief and mourning uh, during uh, the pandemic. One of the things that really struck me straight away was uh, that families were prevented from being with the sick and dying. And it was very painful, very painful. Families reached out to me often to talk about how they felt and of course that huge sense of isolation and being separated from those they loved was 
traumatic. That was word was used earlier today as well. It was traumatic. Husbands, wives, fathers and mothers died without the presence of their family members. It seems incredible now to look back on it. And somebody else used this word. It was surreal. It really was a surreal experience. As a priest, of course, I couldn't visit uh, at certain times uh, the dying in nursing homes or hospitals to give the sacrament of the sick, which in the Catholic tradition is very important. Uh, some people still refer to it as the last rites. And uh, that was difficult for me. I felt very frustrated not being able to, to go into those situations. And also being contacted by families who wanted their loved ones to receive um, the sacrament of uh, the sick or uh, anointing of the sick, or even to receive some uh, words of comfort or prayer uh, from their minister. Uh, you know, it was really difficult when I had to tell them I even I could not go into those situations. I was not permitted to enter the hospital at certain times. Uh, and so, again, that was really difficult for people to accept that, uh, that that was the, the level of restriction that we were living under. And that, that, again, there was some anger, you know, people expressed anger towards me. Why can't you go, uh, you know, and then towards the government, towards health authorities. So, again, there was, there was a little bit of anger around certain of the restrictions. Uh, for me, too, as a priest, uh, you know, the way we administer the last rites or the sacrament of the sick uh, to the dying is a very physical thing. It involves touch. So again, even when we were allowed to go to do that, we weren't allowed to physically touch the person or we had to touch them wearing gloves. And again, you know, uh, the expression of faith or uh, sympathy and the sacramental expression in the Catholic tradition is very, very physical. We touch, we have a healing touch, a comforting touch, and we were not allowed to do that, neither priest nor a family member at times. So again, those points of human contact were stripped away from us. One of the things that I found the most strange was, again, in that context, uh, praying down the telephone where a nurse was holding a telephone against someone who was dying's ear, and I was saying the prayers for the dying down the phone to this unresponsive person, a nurse holding the phone. And even in one strange episode, uh, it seems again surreal, a family asked me to sing Amazing Grace to their dying relative through the telephone where a nurse held the phone up. And, you know, I was in one phone with the family. I had another phone to my ear. I was singing Amazing Grace. The family were listening. The dying person was obviously present as well it was just such a strange way to minister for me uh, so again uh, that experience was an experience of isolation of being separated uh, people were cut off even my, for myself I had a, a friend who died of COVID a very good friend from Montreal who died of COVID uh, and she was at St Mary's Hospital and by the time it was coming out of the pandemic. The time I arranged to go to see her and got through all the hoops through the hospital that I could actually go there, she died before I got there. Now, the only comfort I had was that her niece is a social worker in that hospital and was with her when she died. Otherwise, she would have died, again, separated from all the people that she loved. So, again, this uh, very painful memories for many of us to look back on, on what we experienced. Most people, of course, don't want to die alone. Uh, and most of us don't want to contemplate those whom we love dying alone. Well, they died, I'm sure, in the presence of doctors, nurses and care staff. But, you know, that sense of being separated at that particular moment is very painful. Coming to, you know, the, the whole area of mourning and the rituals concerning mourning, wakes and visitations and funeral services play a very big part in our grief process. Uh, religious or and non-religious people, we like to mark significant milestones with ritual of various kinds. And some of these rituals surround death. Uh, and they're sometimes before a death occurs and then after a death occurs. And these were at some times completely impossible during COVID. And again, it was unprecedented. No one had imagined that and certainly we were not prepared 
for that psychologically, emotionally, or even you know, um, in terms of how we would how we would deal with it. So again, you know, when visitations were not permitted or wakes were not permitted, uh, we couldn't exchange that handshake, that look of sympathy, that expression of sympathy and words that we used to comfort each other in loss. And so again, that was really difficult when you, you're instinctively going to shake someone's hand or hug them and, and you can't. So again, that was difficult even when we could have services. And sometimes we had services where we allowed 25 people or 30 people uh, and, and they were welcome. We welcomed that easing of restrictions at times, but it still was painful for people. And again, at times of a death, people like to share stories. They'd like to tell the life story of the person. They'd like to you know, express uh, their loss but they were unable to do so in person. And that was a big change. Now, we learned to adapt, of course, and human beings are very adaptable. We always find a way to do things. And so, you know, we turned to uh, Zoom, to, to WhatsApp, to all sorts of ways, Facebook Live, in order to still communicate at the time of the death and, uh, and to mourn in a different way, perhaps, than we had before. And for example, one of my communities, very strong in the South Shore, is a Filipino community. And they have a tradition of nine days of prayer after someone died. And they simply shifted that. They're very well connected to the Filipino community. They have their own organizations and they're very well connected. They simply switched to doing that on Zoom. And so again, we learned to adapt. We learned to do things in a new way. And something interesting happened in that uh, when we move to Facebook Live or Zoom to have prayers or even the celebration of Mass from my kitchen table, which I did for many months, uh, was that we actually found we extended beyond our parish boundaries. We reached people beyond our parish boundaries. And so we made connections that we hadn't had before. And, uh, you know, we, we, we learned about each other. Even Ruth's connected to me on Facebook. And uh, again, people stayed connected. But again, in the whole you know, sphere of mourning and grief, it was difficult because we'd like to be together physically and it wasn't possible uh, a lot of the time. The funeral parlours as well, or funeral homes, I should say, they adapted as well by allowing the services, when services were permitted, to be broadcast. And that was really a lifesaver, even though we're probably only allowed 25, 30 people at a service, many, many more people could join online. And, you know, that was important. Uh, when, when funerals uh, were not permitted at all, uh, and gatherings weren't permitted at all during complete lockdowns, uh, people had to wait to bury their deceased relatives and friends. And, of course, uh, that was painful for many people because culturally they like to bury their, their de deceased relatives or, uh, relatives or friends fairly rapidly, and we weren't able to do that. So we had families waiting two, three months sometimes for a funeral. And I thought during that time, you know, when they come to the funeral, what will that feel like? What will the funeral feel like? And I must say, funerals, even though they were delayed two or three months, felt exactly like a funeral of someone who died more recently. The grief was as real, the loss was as real. The expression of loss uh, was as real. And so, again, you know, it was good that we had that outlet again. And it was, you know, important for people to be able to do the rituals that they, they, they felt valuable. The, uh, one of the things that strikes me here in the South Shore, in particular in Brossard, where I live, uh, our parish here, Good Shepherd, we have a lot of immigrants. I'm an immigrant myself. And one of the things that was really difficult was when uh, we couldn't travel back to our uh, places of origin. And many people uh, lost family members during COVID, of COVID or of other diseases uh, during that time. And they were not able to travel home either at the time of the death or uh, afterwards to comfort family members who were still there. And that created huge anxiety, huge uh, feelings of depression and loss. And I saw people turning to Facebook to mourn through Facebook somehow to put up pictures of the, uh, 
person who died to be in contact, obviously, with people who are far away. And, you know, people were adaptable. They found new ways. And one of the things that we did when we did come back to celebrate Mass on a regular basis uh, was we had two Masses, one uh, in St. Hubert and St. Gabriel's Parish, one at Good Shepherd and Brossard, where we invited all those who had been bereaved during COVID, of COVID, uh, deaths or, or through other deaths to come and celebrate Mass together uh, in memory of those who had died and to celebrate their life. And we gathered up all the names of the people and we read those names during the celebration of Mass. And these this was particularly meaningful for people who were not able to travel to attend funerals or to have funerals during COVID. So again, there was a healing experience for people. One of the things that we learned early on, and a lot of people have spoken about this today, was that we needed to contact people and be in touch with people, even though physically we weren't able to do that. So, of course, that's important for those who are grieving, those who are mourning, but also in general, we, we reached out to people. And we felt that we were, were not prepared. We didn't have up-to-date you know, telephone lists, for example, or email lists for parishioners. Uh, so we had to scramble and get all that together and start to reach out. Uh, more effectively and most of our parishes managed to do that we most uh, managed to reach out more effectively as we went on and for example one of our parishes had a phone uh, ministry where they phone people at home and that just sprang up as soon as covid restrictions began and you know it was really powerful we were particularly aware of people who were not on the internet seniors who were not on the internet uh, to reach them and to say hello and you know, I was even uh, surprised that uh, they, they phoned me and, you know, Father, how are you doing? Are you OK? Uh, I was surprised to get a call like that because usually I'm the one asking those questions. How are you doing? Uh, but it was nice uh, to be uh, to be thought of. We did adapt, as I say, most of our services. Um, we tried to do online. We tried to reach out via telephone. We used emails to send bulletins, updates, information. Facebook was really powerful. That was my best tool. Of course, Zoom was really important. And again, we, um, we got some new volunteers who were able to facilitate us with the new technologies and to help. Also, new volunteers for the hygiene of our churches, people who came in when we were allowed to open to implement the really strict hygiene policies that the government recommended to us uh, to keep people safe. And we were very aware of keeping seniors in particular safe who were more vulnerable, but also uh, just our general uh, population safe. One of the things that we struggled with very early on too uh, in, it's not directly in relation to uh, mourning or loss, but it was a loss uh, that we experienced. It was the loss of services that we relied on uh, food bank services, volunteer agencies who, uh, you know, helped seniors and others in our community. And certainly at the start of COVID, they just closed their doors. And so we were left struggling, trying to fight, fill, fill the gaps. And I know you've expressed the anxiety that service providers experienced as well, you know, but that was something that we struggled with because some of our families relied on food bank, uh, on distribution of food uh, by volunteer agencies. And all of a sudden that stopped. Now that was difficult to deal with, but we did find ways of reaching out and new volunteers again, took up the role of simply you know, delivering food, uh, leaving it outside the house, not having contact with the people. You know, we, we adapted. One of the things that we learned too during COVID uh, was to reach out beyond the limits of our parish boundaries, to look for, for help elsewhere, to look for resources elsewhere. And that was important. Um, we developed good practices and best practices, and we need to, to keep them up. One of the things we were still doing is we're doing things in a hybrid way. So some people attend something on Zoom, uh, others are in person. So if someone's not comfortable to come to a meeting in person, they can attend on Zoom often and we facilitate that. So, you know, that's that's something we've learned to, to be flexible, not always to expect it to fit the same pattern. One of the things we learned, of course, through COVID uh, experience is that life goes on and uh, our parishioners uh, you know, adapted, we adapted as uh, service providers to them. 
And uh, whilst life goes on, dying also happens. Grieving, mourning, and the experience of loss happens as well. And again, what I re recognised during COVID was that great resilience uh, that people have and the fact that people wanted to reach out. The, that impulse to build family, build community was still there. And of course, that's uh, the beauty of, of our existence, that we, we want to be in community, we want to be in family, we want to be in touch with people. And so thank God we're coming out of uh, that experience, uh, hopefully having learned something. But we did, I think, suffer. We did suffer as communities and we're still recovering, individuals recovering from their experience of isolation, of depression, of fear, but also as communities we're still recovering. And even that's reflected in the attendance at church, we still haven't got back to what we were before the pandemic. So again, it's a process. I often think of the words of Queen Elizabeth, the late Queen Elizabeth, when she addressed uh, people during the pandemic uh, and very important uh, television address. And she said, uh, we will all meet again. We will all meet again. And I think she offered a, a word of hope in that, that, you know, the human spirit is resilient. We're able to adapt. We're able to build again, rebuild. And again, that's something that we hold on to because during the pandemic, I think what everybody held on to was hope. We had hoped that it would end. And again, our task is that whilst the pandemic has, in a sense, ended, there's still work to be done in recovery, um, in reassuring people uh, that life does indeed go on and that uh, we are able to adapt, we're able to um, do things in a way which works for us in the instant that perhaps we had never imagined we'd have to do before. So thank you very much. Thank you, Father Manus. Uh, very touching, and I think we all can relate to it. I think even if we didn't have anybody in our family uh, passing away or seriously ill, uh, whether you're a religious person or not, when you're in a crisis, you turn to your faith, and uh, or if you're whatever your life circumstances are, and when you're limited and you can't do it, um, you know. I mean, you can always say your prayers to, you know, between yourself and your whatever religious God you have, uh, but it's not the same as having the community of the church. Uh, and it's very encouraging to hear that younger people step forward and were volunteering. I think if the one thing positive that if there's any that I take from COVID-19 is that it made society very aware of seniors uh, the value that seniors have, um, more compassion towards seniors, uh, where I think in the past well, well, they were there, but everybody was just sort of passing by in the night. Uh, they take the time even today, you know, a year or so later when it's not so severe, uh, to stop and talk and how are you? Uh, so that's one good positive thing. Um, the loss of the human touch, just a hug, just hello, how are you? Being in contact physically with someone has such great value. So I thank you tremendously for your time, uh, for the work that you do, and for your caring and compassion. Uh, it comes through loud and clear and always has. And so without hearing from me anymore, we've got some time, and I hope people have been putting questions in uh, the chat box. And Katia, I'm going to turn it over to you uh, to lead us in the question period. Okay, thanks, Ruth. Um, so I think I just need a second to process everything that was said because it, it is bringing back uh, a lot of pretty intense memories of uh, the pandemic. Um, so yeah, I just need, need one one wee second to just process everything. But I think the first question I'd like to ask is. Um, and it has to do with volunteers. So I know a lot of uh, community organizations or parishes relied quite heavily on volunteers. And the one thing I learned very quickly when I started at Seniors Action, which was six weeks before the pandemic started, um, was the amount of seniors who were working as volunteers at the time. And then a lot of these places just lost their volunteers. 
So I guess my question is, can you talk a little bit about that and also um, have the seniors returned into their, their volunteer positions and are your numbers back to where they, they were pre, pre COVID? I don't know who wants to start, whoever wants to take the floor, go for it. Well, um, I'm, I'll speak, but, but um, for Beth care, we didn't really have volunteers. So um, I think that, um, you know, as far as there were always people that wanted to help. So even in, in our situation, even though we didn't have volunteers, all our employees are paid, you had like the individuals that work in our office that were just stepping up and doing crazy things for people. So call it volunteers, call it however you would like to articulate it. But um, our internal staff became just individuals that were running, going, coming and buying and delivering and trying to do anything to just make somebody feel that somebody else was thinking about them and that they weren't totally alone. So, you know, that that's at our end. But um, for individuals that had volunteers, then, you know, like to know that the younger people stepped up. I saw that too. I saw that as well. Younger people were really stepping up for the elderly. I saw it in many cases. So that was heartwarming. For for me, uh, we, we do rely on a lot of volunteers, of course, in parishes. And uh, we have some great people. One of the things that I did notice in relation to seniors, some seniors took COVID and the break that COVID um, caused in, in how we operated as an opportunity to step back. And this is very important because some seniors are feel trapped as volunteers. You know, they've been doing it for a long time. They're willing to do it. They wanted to do it. They were enthusiastic. But as time goes on, they want to stay, you know, I want to hand this over to somebody else. I would like to take a break. So COVID did actually provide a little break for some people to say, I'm going to step back and I hope someone steps forward to fill my place. So that's a significant thing I think that happened during COVID. Maybe a positive thing. Yeah. I totally agree with you. It was, um, I find especially when it comes in, in our parish here, uh, all the volunteers were in their 80s, if not sometimes 90s. And uh, yes, that's that was uh, there was a very conscious decision there to to step back um, during the during the pandemic because so many people uh, younger people were not working. We had an influx of help in that way and volunteerism. But then as people return to their jobs, um, we have we don't have the amount of volunteers we had in the past so uh there is that and i think volunteering has changed i think that um being um brought into one particular job or or thing that you do for for someone or or a community um i think it's it's how can i put this you're not there for you're not there all the time. So it's, you're just being asked at, at cer on certain occasions. Oh, could you help out with this? Or not always being the go-to. You know, people really value their time now, and and they don't. They're they're going to pick and choose. I find the boomers uh, are very very much different than. Um, uh, the older generation, uh, they value their time and they're going to pick and choose how they volunteer. Um, so, yeah, you can't rope them in for like uh, uh, everything. <laughs> you go for what their specialty is. So, yeah, that's a new reality for us. I think we um, saw a big change in the volunteers. As I said, a lot of our volunteers were 70 or over. And even the ones who were a bit younger um, Diane's right. Uh, they found other opportunities. So now we're 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 back. We have like a good 650 volunteers. It's still a third of less of what we had before. Uh, a lot of people who used to volunteer, they got busy with their grandchildren. So when we call them back, they go, "Sorry, I'm carpooling. I can't." Or, "Sorry, I'm taking care of my my grandchild." Or they found something else that interests them. Some of them did find part-time jobs. 
And the other thing is the retirement age, 65, doesn't really hold anymore. A lot of people, whether it be because of financial reasons or because they just want to continue uh, or find a new career, they're working still. They're not going, they're not coming into the volunteer market. But we're trying to uh, teach the younger people volunteering is very important in our community. So we have, that's why we have like kids that are 12 years old, you know, you have to do a certain amount of volunteer hours for school. We get them in. We also do corporate volunteerism so that they can learn about us and the importance of supporting seniors. It's a very challenging area though right now for to find volunteers and to maintain them because we had a few people that volunteered and they tried something and they go, no, this isn't right for me. So then we go back and say, okay, there's other volunteer opportunities. What would you like? Um, so I think it's very challenging right now for volunteers. And, I, and I'm hearing that from other organizations as well. Yeah, I've, I've heard that as well, Brenda. So, yeah. Um, Beth, actually, I had a question specifically for you, and I just want to make sure I heard you correctly. Did you say during the pandemic that you had staff move in with uh, your, your with patients? Not me. Okay, so, so sorry. My we refer to um, the people I care for our clients. Clients, pardon they're me. They're not patients, they're not ill. Yes. Right? They're not medically ill. Mm -hmm. So my question about, about that, so when you had staff moving in with clients, so I apologize, not patients, clients, and they stayed X amount of time with them, and then when they had to go back to their life, life. what was that like? Because that had to be it was really surreal intense. again. Um, you know, it's interesting because the only reason why I brought that up was because um, it so happened to have uh, struck yesterday morning, a conversation came up and I actually, um, you know, right away when I was having the conversation with this specific caregiver, I said, oh, now there's a positive that came out of the pandemic. It was just so interesting. So we had a few homes where it where care was um, needed for 24 seven. And um, each situation was very different because um, we all live with different challenges. So um, this, this one situation was a very prominent uh, wealthy lady in the community had uh, physical and cognitive issues and she had 24 hour care and um, when the pandemic hit, it was shut down, nobody's, and, and it was the time, which you're all going to remember, where buildings wouldn't let people come in and out to drop off things. So if there was a schedule in a home where more than one person was there, they wouldn't let them in. They wouldn't let them change over the caregivers. So there was always a situation, right? We had so many different challenges, but there there was this one specific home where two caregivers moved in with the lady and um, they lived there around the clock for maybe two months or maybe, maybe I don't even remember. Honestly, maybe it was five months. <laughs> I really don't remember. But yesterday morning, uh, the caregiver and I were discussing something and she started to talk to me about how she'll never forget that whole experience and how it's changed her and how she's grown from it. And she's learned, um, this lady was, um, um, she only ate natural foods. So the caregivers learned a whole different way of eating. Uh, they became extremely mindful of the foods they put in their mouth and, um, they learned how to do Jewish cooking. One was Nigerian and one was Filipino and they were both young women. So they both learned how to do Jewish cooking, but yet with this twist of completely healthy, smooth smoothies and, and um, greens. And so she just expressed how those months in that house and uh, learning the culture and the different ways of doing things. She says, it's just, helped her become a more mature and strong individual. And, and that was a positive. So yeah, there were a few homes where the doors were locked down and caregivers moved in. And we had to be very creative. <laughs> yeah, the famous pivoting. 
that that famous word that everyone used where yet we have to pivot yeah um so i have a question that i i'll i'll extend to everyone um if we were ever to go through another pandemic again because who knows um are there any protocols that you would like to see change considering your experiences and what you saw and lived through It's a big one, I know. If you need a second, go for it. <laughs> Repeat it. Well, I said, so if if we have to go through another pandemic, if, if there is another pandemic down the line, um, are there any of the protocols or restrictions um, that you would like to see changed considering your lived experience? Go for it, Father. I think the most painful thing during the pandemic was the fact that people in hospital were separated from their families. People died, not just those who were dying, but those who were ill were also separated from their families. I think we've learned enough through this experience uh, that we can protect people through you know, various PPE and whatever. I mean, even if it means a restricted number can go in. And I think we did learn it as the pandemic went on but I would never want to see that complete separate isolation of people again. I think that was really destructive uh, psychologically, emotionally for people. And it's really hard to recover from that. Uh, people still talk about, you know, I couldn't go in, I couldn't go in, they wouldn't let me. And so again, that's a difficult one. That's the only thing I would like to see uh, never again, you know. Uh, if it can be done safely, of course. And I mean, I'm all for all this necessary precautions in our parishes. We did everything according to the government's instructions. Uh, you know, I'm not uh, anti any restrictions, but that was really difficult. If it can be done safely, I would never like to see that happen again, you know. So I, I agree with um, Father, and I also think that um, the other part of it is, uh, as, we, as we had both mentioned, was the grieving process. It really did affect a lot of people. Uh, it's hard enough losing a family member and then to lose them tragically and not be able to, like, how do you decide if it's you or another family member? You're trying to say, like, okay, and you had to be the same person over and over again. It's not like you could take turns. It was very difficult choice to do that um and then you know at one point they weren't even allowing people to accompany someone who's giving birth I mean you want your mom there or you want somebody there with you they weren't allowing those kind of things I think we learned a little bit about that that you know we have to approach it more humanistically for those areas I think a lot of people will continue to be scarred I still hear people talking about it you know, when my mother or father passed away, I wasn't there. I didn't wasn't able to say the things I wanted to say. So I think we have to find other other uh, ways to approach that. I mean, as far as like programs go, like one of the things that we're doing is we're maintaining a virtual approach for a lot of the areas that we have. We will maintain that. It does reach a lot of more people, um, and it also helps a lot of the people um, who don't have easy access to transport or you know, who are more comfortable doing things at home, like you don't want to exercise in front of a bunch of people. And as I said, to people in the outskirts who are living far away in a smaller town um, and they don't have any English services, so they're able to join on virtually. So I think the virtual aspect is very important, but I would like to see if it does happen again to bring back a bit of the humanistic side as well. I don't want to get too political here, but um, <laughs> it really exposed it really exposed the holes in our healthcare system. Um, will they ever be filled again? I don't know. Uh, but when it came to seniors, there was a huge, huge, huge uh, hole in how in basically how we look at our seniors, how we treat our seniors, how we value them. Um, and I hope, I really, really hope that especially the situation in long-term care improves. Um, 
that's what I would really, really hope for. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Um, so one final question, because it kind of it's a good follow up for what um, what was just said. So just you know, personal experience during the lockdowns. Um, I used to do what I used to call a mental health walk. <laughs> so I would do it in the morning before clocking on in the living room and then just to get out of my apartment. And then I would take one in the afternoon just because it was just, I every day I had to watch the two press conferences, the federal and the provincial. And then I would have to send um, a, a brief to the then uh, executive director. And it always had, you know, hospitalizations, death tolls, age groups. So it just got a bit too much after a while. So I just, I used to go for a mental health walk in the afternoon. So, um, so my, so with that little tidbit there, um, I know during the, the lockdown that just no one had time to process anything. You were just in go-go mode and pivoting and figuring out what to do. Um, but I know self-care became, from my point of view, a uh, big topic between employers and employees is you need to take care of yourself. You need to take care of yourself. But the thing that I'm seeing now, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, there I find there's a delayed reaction with people. Uh, and I think it's just maybe the adrenaline levels just came down. I don't know. Or we just took time to take a step back. So now that you know you have staff or volunteers or people that you work with or you know seniors that are that are involved in in your organizations um what what are you what are you noticing now or what are you seeing or how can okay maybe that's it, like little red flags or how can you help people with this weird collective delayed reaction that everyone's going through um so it's huge. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. It's, it's beyond everything's changed. Uh, people are more into self-care. People um, will not give of themselves the way they used to. I don't know if it will come back. Um, people are more self-protective of their time, their energy, the way they share, the way they give to others. I'm not saying that people have shut down. I'm saying that there is a huge shift. So um, where in, in my work life, where I could ask for favors and compensate people before, they have very strong walls around them now. And that is the biggest, biggest shift that I find as a business person, trying to bring in people. I mean, everything we do is is with vulnerable people. Every, every, every decision we make, we have to think of so many different areas that we have to take care of people and, and not just the client, but the, the caregivers and their families. So there's a lot that goes into a, a question when you ask somebody, can you, you know, work on Saturday? I understand you never work on Saturday or can you stay an extra hour or can you do this favor for this family? And there are so many um, uh, restrictions now with, with, with people. So I, I do find that people are just putting walls around them and really protecting themselves after this experience. I think uh, for for me, we, we've learned, as I said at the end of my uh, presentation, to do things in a sort of hybrid way, not always to expect people to travel for a meeting or come together in a group. And again, I, I find myself a little bit resistant to doing it hybrid because I like to get people together. I think it's much more productive. I like to have people in the room for the energy it creates. But again, we've had to say, okay, this person is not comfortable. Uh, so, so we can do that. We can facilitate that. The other thing we ran last year in one of my parishes, we had it for all the parishioners, uh, was a workshop called Listening with Compassion just to allow people to develop some skills uh, of listening, but also so that they would feel that 
it's possible that somebody's going to listen to me when I speak about my experience of the pandemic. And some people attended because they have relationship problems within their marriage or whatever it is. But others came simply that they wanted to open up more to people again after this experience of being shut down and even shut up in a sense and told to be quiet uh, and do what you have to do to get through this. So again, I think that's a way forward for our communities. I certainly want to develop that uh, skill of uh, listening with compassion among people in our parishes that again, we listen to people where they're at. And again, as part of the cool Catholic church's ethos at the minute, we're moving from being a teaching church, teaching people what to do, telling people what to do, to listening to people where they're at. And again, that's something that we're not good at often, but certainly with volunteers, we need to listen to their needs. We need to be responsive to their needs, not just to take them for granted. And again, I think what the pandemic taught a lot of us is we, we took a lot for granted. And maybe we can appreciate things and people more now that we've emerged from the other end. So that's a learning that perhaps we, we, we've, we've uh, gained. Yeah. Um, we always learn, I think, from from different uh, things that we've done. Uh, one of the things that we saw, or we continue to see, and I don't know if you see this as well, but finding employees is is uh, very challenging. Uh, a lot of the younger crowd feel that they, um, you know, they come with a lot of new demands that you wouldn't have asked, you know, five six years ago. So the first question is what's my salary? And, you know, you used to ask that only at the end when you got your job. But I think that uh, manpower is one of the few things that we're finding a challenge. The other thing that we found very challenging was, uh, and we developed something new as a result, people lost, without them realizing it, they lost a lot of their physical and mental health. So people um, lost some of their cognitive abilities without even realizing it, or their families realizing it. And they're saying, well, before the pandemic, you know, uh, Mrs. G used to be able to do this, but we see that Mrs. G is not able to do it anymore. And the families are having a hard time understanding well, why not. They could be living in Vancouver and they're saying, oh, but my mother's fine, you know. So we're trying, we tried uh, something new. We just started, it's called a concierge service evaluation for people to try to understand what they want and what their abilities are so that they can participate in programs and still have a, a good sense of well-being without failure, for example, and a feeling of accomplishment while they're socializing with others. So that's one of the things that came out of the pandemic for good or for bad. But um, there's other things too, but that's gonna be my, in the next one, next Friday. <laughs> Um, well, when it can't, when it comes to self care, um, and, and, uh, um, realizing how much the, the pandemic did affect us, number one, as staff and how it affected our seniors, I found it difficult in the beginning to, um, even address with seniors, um, their mental health, um, but it became a kind of, uh, I don't know, not buzzword, but um, resiliency and, and, and what are the factors of res resiliency. And, and we ended up actually, they ended up opening up and speaking more about it uh, because my experience with seniors for the last, you know, 30 years was that they don't complain. It's okay, everything's fine, I'm fine. You know, it, it, they they always accepted life uh, as it was, and they weren't going to complain about it. Uh, and actually, having to express their emotions about uh, the situation they were thrown into uh, was difficult <laughs> to get them to open up. Um, but it did it did come. It did come not with everyone, and so yeah people are more at ease speaking about their mental health and, and what, what the factors uh, that can contribute to better, better self-care and stuff like that. Uh, looking inward more. Uh, 
stuff. Yeah, that's uh, what I found. Well, I think we're right at three o'clock. Uh, there's no more questions. We uh, will uh, move right along. I want to thank all of you, Brenda, Beth, Diane, Father Manis. It has been tremendous. I know some of the subject matter it was heavy, but I think that's also part of the therapy and moving forward is to get it out, acknowledge it and move forward if at all possible. Um, I really appreciate your time. I know uh, you you did a lot of back and forth with me. And, uh, uh, you know, this is not something that our presenters just throw together in five minutes. So the people who are uh, participants, I hope they appreciate it. I just want to also fly to you next Friday. We are wrapping up the uh, last two sessions on the impact of COVID-19 and seniors' mental health. And in the morning session, we will have some of the same presenters back that we had today, but we're going to be talking about lessons learned, the new norm, and moving forward. The very last session is going to be on what worked well and what still needs to be done. We tried to get a government official and that did not work, but we got a medical expert and we also have someone that you've all probably, especially organizations have seen and heard and it's a big hot topic right now, is homelessness. We have Sam Watts, the CEO of Welcome Hall Mission. They're now getting a lot of seniors. So they're going to be talking about uh, what still needs to be done. Uh, so if you've not registered and you want to, uh, please get your uh, email to me and uh, we'll get you on the list. Uh, once again, I thank all the participants who are registration, re registrants who are in their offices and their wellness centers and their home for coming and participating with us. And there is a survey, uh, survey monkey that was sent to you with the agenda and the link for today's session. We ask that you complete it and get it uh, and just submit it. Uh, that's stats and information that we need for our funders and also to know uh, how you feel about these sessions. Uh, great seeing you all face to face online and thank you once again. Go and enjoy the rest of the afternoon and have a marvelous safe weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you very much, everybody. Nice to meet everybody. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>